just a reminder this we're going to run this session in a kind of question time format um so please do put questions in the chat function um we may be able to uh, open up discussions um later on depending on uh how it all flows but uh if you put your questions in the chat function we'll really try ev do everything we can to try and get those questions to the panel over the course of the next 90 minutes so it's it's three minutes past eight um i'd like to welcome you all to the um book launch for power and connection <laughs> for this book that um we're really proud to publish um it was a real pleasure working with particularly ralph eddie and nick on on the book um it, we went we did a lot of work to try and make the the book as clear and as accessible as possible but also to bring together and synthesize a real wide range of the findings and the thinkings and the latest developments in local area coordination uh, so very proud of the book and um, I'm sure some of the issues in the book uh, will be discussed over the next 90 minutes. Um, you're very welcome to purchase the book um, and you're very welcome to go directly to uh, the, the authors of the Local Area Coordination Network uh, to get access to copies of the book also. Um, okay, where shall I begin? Well. First of all, let me say who we've got here. So I'm just going to, I have the pleasure of giving a, a very brief um, biography of the people present. This is not really adequate to all the many, many different things that people have done, but we have Eddie Bartnick with us. Um, so anyone familiar with uh, international developments in social justice and inclusion um, will know about Eddie's pioneering work on local area coordination. One of the original people Behind the development of the concept, Eddie has been very active globally, um, helping people understand the value of this work and helping governments think about how to uh, implement it for real. We've got Ralph Broad. Um, Ralph is somebody who has been critical to the development of local area coordination in England um, and Wales, the development of the local area caution network, but he's also um, been very active back in Australia, where he originally comes from, although I have to say he's, he's now really a resident of uh, the north of England, where the best place in the world, so we're very happy that he's here too, but the, um, it, he's, he now also has been leading the work to support the development of local area coordination in Singapore, which is a very exciting development. We have Nick uh, Sinclair here, who leads the development of local area coordination in England and Wales and convenes the local area coordination network. And he's also the founding chair of Culture Connect, a member led organization of people from all over the world living in Tyneside, many of whom are refugees and people seeking asylum in the UK, which I was just saying to uh, Nick in the in the introductory section, the how excited I was to discover that because that's really important work in the times like this where you know, we have even governments excluding people and um, disregarding people's human rights. And finally, um, we've got Sean Roderick, who's Senior Lecturer and Deputy Director of Postgraduate Research in the School of Management at Swansea University. And she's led important research on the implementation of local area coordination in Swansea and is continues to be working in on these issues. Uh, so it's great to have a, a proper kosher academic with us. Uh, always hard uh, to, to get them to break away from the university context. And Sean has to leave us, sadly, at 10 to 9 to go and teach people. How outrageous is that? But um, so I'll probably try and bring Sean into the conversation early as we talk. Um, OK, so I'll just repeat again for anybody who's joined recently. This is a kind of question time format. So. The panel is going to be here. Uh, we're going to. We're, this is going to be a chance to ask people the kind of questions that you that are really on your mind about local area coordination. We're going. I'm going to ask some initial questions of the panelists, and then um, I'm going to try and 
give them as many questions as you as you give me. If you don't give me questions, I will. I have plenty up my sleeve anyway. Um, I just wanted to say at the outset, um, I think the question Eddie wanted me to ask is why is local area coordination important today for, from my perspective? And um, I suppose one of the things that really I admire about the efforts around local area coordination is, is this intentionality around thinking about how people connect to community. In, in a way, a lot of my own work in the past has been very focused on ideas like self-directed support, personal budgets. How can we shift power over services to people who need support? But in a way, local area coordination to me provides a, a kind of prior, and in a way, in the order of things, a more important question is how can we make sure people's lives, families and communities are functioning in a way that means that people don't necessarily need to be engaged with services. There are very many things in life that go much better uh, if you can sort things out without relying on even excellent public services or personal budgets or any of these arrangements. There are a lot of people's lives who go wrong for too much loneliness or a problem that's not get, doesn't get spotted and gets and starts becoming an even bigger problem. Um, it's the lack of community, in a way, that's the fundamental problem so so often. And local area coordination doesn't pretend to be the answer to that in some kind of universal way, like a, a service answer to the problem of community. What I like about it is it's the very disciplined, thoughtful approach which says. The system itself, government and, and all of its attendant services, has to give intentional, um, a positive intention to making sure that people are connected to community. It obviously needs to do lots of other different things as well. But this thoughtful approach, which prioritises community, has been so lacking for so long. And so to see... Um, people putting practical measures in place uh, and then thinking very hard about what's working, amending and developing those ideas is really inspiring. And to see a social innovation that's really been um, carefully developed over now what is, well, over 30 years, it is very, very um, inspiring. So um, that's that's why I think it's important because it's it's, it's not pretending to solve a problem, which is in a sense a huge problem, but it's committing to seeing that problem as the central problem. And it provides a bridge to ensure that states and services stay connected to community. That's what I like about it. Um, so I'm gonna ask my first question to Ralph. And I, I'd like, Ralph, could you say a little bit about just in general terms, because, you know, we know some people who are here today are people who are quite expert, but some people might not know very much about local area coordination at all. So could you explain what it is and how it works? Uh, yes, well, thank you, Simon, and um, uh, I welcome everyone who's, who's watching as well. It's re really nice to be involved. Uh, and thanks, Simon, for, for hosting this session also and, and your long term support and um, uh, with local area coordination, much appreciated. Okay, so look, I'll do a quick four or five minutes uh, around uh, what local area coordination is and, and how it works. And I think starting from the start, I just got to recognise that for many people, uh, finding earlier ongoing assistance with issues they might face in life can be really hard sometimes, and services can be quite difficult to access and, and navigate. If, if they don't meet eligibility criteria, uh, sometimes have to often wait for the situation to get worse before uh, being eligible for help. This can store up further issues, family breakdown, potential harm and increased costs for the future. It's not desirable, it's not sustainable and it just doesn't make sense. So local area coordination's trying to turn this upside down, being very accessible in a local community, no rationing or eligibility, people can access it directly and having a much stronger focus on prevention and capacity building. Now we'll probably use those terms quite a bit today. So local area coordination itself is an accessible, long-term, evidence-based capacity building approach for walking alongside people of all ages and all backgrounds in our communities. 
It moves from a crisis and service focus to a much more inclusive, uh, whole person, whole community, prevention, capacity building and resilience focus. So it's uh, trying to do almost the, the exact opposite. But as Simon says, that, that real strong connection with services and community at the same time. So some key local coordination outcomes include fundamental stuff, people living rich and fulfilling lives, having supportive natural relationships, being active, valued, contributing citizens, and, and really paying attention to nurturing family resilience. Uh, these create the conditions for reducing demand for and dependency on services and funding. You can't do it through eligibility or, or rationing. It happens through building resilience. The idea of service users to citizens. Now, it's also about building more welcoming, inclusive and supportive communities, stronger communities uh, where we can connect with people uh, are part of the solution as well, the things working together. And it's also about contributing to transforming service systems and making more effective use of resources where services have a really strong partnership with and connection to community and they complement rather than replace the wonderful stuff that happens in community. COVID has taught us that community is really strong and really supportive. We need to support that, not interrupt it. So how do they do it? To start, really important, local coordinators are recruited in partnership with local communities. Uh, they're embedded in and connected with both the community and the system. And they work alongside people and families, person by person, family by family, community by community. Everyone is unique. They'll be available in a range of accessible community locations and mobile across the local community for both early help and ongoing support. So this could include short term support alongside anyone from the community, uh, high level prevention, helping them to build capacity, connections and resilience to remain part of their community, avoid crisis and avoid services wherever possible in the first place but also some longer term support alongside people who might be facing some really complex or enduring life issues. So people at imminent risk of crisis or becoming dependent and helping them to find sustainable local solutions and helping them to stay strong in their community, but also people who are already dependent on services uh, to become less dependent and more connected and more resilient back in their own community. The local coordinators themselves, so it's a person working in a, uh, in a small local community, uh, they start by taking time to listen and getting to know people, families and communities well. Understand what matters to them, their strengths, aspirations, their contributions, as well as their needs. If you only look at needs, you end up in services or waiting for services. And this is with the aim of helping to build resilience, relationships and sustainable local solutions wherever possible. The local coordination role itself is really important. So we, we call it the connected role in the book. To make things simpler for people, local coordination combines a range of traditionally separate roles into one person, and that person's uh, locally accessible. A simple, accessible point of contact and support in the community alongside people of all ages and all backgrounds in that community. So potentially, instead of having 10 people doing one thing, coming into someone's life who's facing really complex issues, you have one person who's local, uh, who does a whole range of things or can, can offer a whole range of things alongside people and families, but also in strong partnership with important services in the community itself. These might include access to information, self-advocacy, speaking up, really intentionally building personal relationships and, and local networks. These three things drive choice and control, uh, information, self-advocacy and, and relationships. Really working to understand what people can do for themselves, their wonderful strengths, their aspirations, their goals, their needs, finding practical ways of doing the things they want or need to do, helping people to plan for the future and the practical support to make it happen in partnership with communities and people who know them and love them uh, and help people to connect with me part of community life and contribute to community life importantly but also at the end um, helping people to access choose and control support and services if they need the right support at the right time in the right way so to summarize some key factors that really drive this what i think is a beautiful thing called local coordination is taking time to get to know people well over time building trusting relationships uh, and working alongside people, not in front, not behind, but alongside at the person's pace 
pace at the speed of trust. Uh, local economy is being well connected to the local community, being based locally in places valued by and accessible to local people. They'll hold really positive values and assumptions about people, families and communities. Uh, we see our job as ca building capacity with the, with the key aim of building self-determination, self-sufficiency, rather than just providing a, a, a service or a short-term fix to a problem. And building strong partnerships with services, stronger together. Services are an important part of this, this combination. And, and I suppose the starting point is asking the right questions. What's a good life for someone, not just what services does someone need? Um, I'll leave it at that because lots of other things will come out. I hope that's useful starting point for people who are new to this. Thanks, Ralph. So that sounds really logical to me. But Eddie, could you give people a sense of the where this innovation began and how it's developed and, and, and see how the times we were nervous about the filling the time and then it's just flying away, isn't it? So let's try and be as concise as we can. Sure. Thanks, Simon and Ralph. And hi, everybody. Um, I've had the privilege of being on the local coordination journey for the past 30 years. So I thought I'd just quite quickly cover some of the key stages and milestones, and then share a few sort of key reflections on, the, on our learnings from the process. So uh, back in 1987 in, in Western Australia, where I'm from, um, a town called Albany. So Western Australia was a population of less than 2 million people, over 2.5 million square kilometres, and Albany was four hours from Perth. And back in those days, if you had a child with a disability, often the person or the family would have to leave their community to go to where the services were, typically in the city or in the larger regional centres. So um, we knew what the problem was. Um, we got some inspiration from families in Canada who were um, helping um, move their family members out of institutions. And they came up with the idea about separating out planning and support and the resources from the delivery of the services, this idea of sort of planning and brokerage. So we decided in Albany to, to try something different. We, we found and appointed a really great local person from the community. And we said, your job is to uh, get to know and support local people, look to the community first, and then we can add funding or services to the equation. And that's pretty much how it started. One community, a um, um, long way away from Perth. We did an evaluation after a couple of years and it was really good. Lots of positives on every level. So we did other regional areas, we learned about other disabilities, we did some metro stuff, and then we did the whole state. So every couple of years, a big evaluation, we learned, and then we sort of grew. We also grew to some other states in, in Australia with some varying levels of uh, success. But importantly, around 2000, um, projects started in other countries, Scotland, Northern Ireland, England and Wales, New Zealand, Republic of Ireland, and, um, and more recently, um, in 2021 in Singapore. And then back in our, my home country in, in Australia, from 2013, the National Disability Insurance Scheme came in and local area coordination became part of the whole country um, design of that scheme. And instantly I'll come back to, in WA where it all started, we took some of the learnings from England and Wales and did things differently here with a broader population group. So from one population group in one small setting, we now seven or eight different countries and a wide range of population groups across social care and health. A couple of key reflections, um, every stage of the way, evaluation and evidence. Secondly, Ralph spoke about some of the principles of local coordination. They're rock solid over the 30 years. Um, our approach has been preserve the core, but stimulate change and grow. And again, sort of we, we inspired the work in England and Wales they in fact then in turn inspired us to use local coordination with much broader population groups. Um, just, a, just a very quick story, back in the old days um, in Albany, people were leaving the community, which one again to come back, stay in where they were and also to come back. I had a beautiful image, a story of uh, Peter, who was our first local coordinator, a family were coming from Perth back to the community. And when they arrived, they said, oh, Peter, Peter was waiting in the driveway for us. And for me, it was a bit like this image of, fly in, fly out, distant, disconnected support, all of a sudden a local person getting to know you, connected to the local community and working with you and the local community. So that's the basic idea that we started with and we've grown. Thank you.
Brilliant, Eddie. Thank you. That's really clear. And that does link us um, very well to Sean, because as you say, research has been a constant thread in the development of local area coordination. And it was great to read some of the outcomes that Sean was responsible for in the book. And it was great to hear, sorry, to, this sounds a bit funny, but um, it was great to hear from an academic researcher that kind of sense of the importance of the integrity of a concept which you don't always get, I think, in my experience of some of the research work in, in social sciences. So, Sean, can you tell us a little bit about what you experienced, what some of the learning was in Swansea and, and any broader reflections? Yes, absolutely. First of all, thank you for having me and congratulations on the book as well. And I do apologise that I have to leave early. I'm, I'm so sorry about that, but this is this is wonderful. And you know, the fantastic work you're doing, it's, it's inspiring stuff. But for my um, quite boring academic position, um, for us in Swansea, so back in 2015, we were tasked with writing a formative evaluation. So local area coordination was very new to the area, uh, but the local authority wanted to change things in line with the uh, recent um, changes in, in the law around the Social Care and Wellbeing Act in Wales. Um, and they felt that local area coordination really fitted that uh, movement for change. Uh, so my task then was to uh, start the evaluation process. And I have to admit, this is an area that was very new to me. Um, so the first thing for us to do was to really try and understand what local area coordination was. I know that sounds really obvious, but it wasn't really until we, uh, we went to the recruitment process, we went to the leadership groups, we went to the coordinators induction days. That really gave us a sense of, of what this was about. Um, and I think if we just read it on a manual, it wouldn't have been the same experience for us. We also went to uh, prevention panels. So we got to saw other services and other partners uh, working in this space and their perspectives as well. So we were able to get a, a sense of the landscape, so to speak. Um, for our evaluation experience, it, it started to grow. It started to become very nebulous from the original brief as more and more people got to hear about local area coordination and, and its potential. Um, that was a real learning curve for us. So we were at risk almost of dehumanizing the effort and the endeavor because it was starting to become very nebulous. So we worked very quickly with um, our partners then and the local authority to sort of keep those parameters nice and neat. So that anyone taking on evaluation, that's a little bit of advice. Um, Data capture as well becomes quite tricky because when you start, to, when the evaluation starts to grow, uh, you're looking at different data sets and also different interests and the focus for the research becomes slightly uh, grey rather than a nice clear objective. So we went through a lot of learning processes as we were writing, but we saw a real opportunity here for some innovative research methodologies. Um, and we used something called relationship and network mapping. So we were able to show a community before a coordinator arrived, and then we were able to map the data points to show what a community looks like six months after, eight months after a, a coordinator is dropped into that area and then starts to get to work. And the results were really phenomenal. We, we didn't expect the amount of, of data to be coming back to us at such an early stage. Although it is important to acknowledge that, um, you know, this is a slow burn. It's not something that's gonna be a panacea or a, you know, a rapid action. It's the beauty about local area coordination is the time that is taken to build trust and quality relationships with people. Um, so it, it is a challenge for evaluation, certainly. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say is it's really important to make evaluation meaningful. So we went to lots of meetings where people were talking about what's the cost benefit, and that's all they wanted to focus on. 
but for us it it was you know that was the wrong question that was the wrong place to start and it's all about people and communities and families and driving systems change as well to support them so um it, it, we wanted to make a document that was insightful, but also could be used as a tool for learning and to springboard off. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, we, we've just been told we're gonna to be doing the summative evaluation now for Swansea. So we're five years on, uh, we've experienced COVID of course, and local area coordination was instrumental in maintaining community resilience through that. Uh, but there's been some real uh, learning in terms of processes and systems as well. Um, do I have much more time, Simon? Or do I? Do I uh, me, I'll, I'll, I'll ask. I'll ask Nick a question, Sean, and then yes, okay, then fine. I'll come back to you. <laughs> but that was all really interesting, and again, very encouraging from to in terms of the relationship between the innovation and um, research community. But um, so, Nick. Nick, you lead the Local Area Coordination Network for England and Wales. I mean, one of the things that I think is really inspiring about Local Area Coordination generally has been the commitment. And I think some of this is down to people like Eddie and Ralph and, and their attitude, but the commitment to developing an idea with integrity, not just throwing <laughs> ideas out there, but actually how do we really make this work? And, and then developing a network seems to be a, an important part of that, doesn't it? Could you say a little bit about the, the function of the network, how it works and what, what it achieves? Yeah, definitely. No, and I think that's, you're quite right there, Simon, about that, that word you use there, integrity. I think that's a very telling one because this, I think essentially the network is about how we maintain that integrity, uh, essentially in England and Wales anyway, um, which is, as you said, the bit I, I lead. Um, so yeah, I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about that and just to say it's lovely to see so many people here uh, today and uh, how great this is to be having this conversation about this wonderful book. Um, and our network has just been so privileged and delighted to be part of it and just reading it back this morning as I was waking up and looking at some of the stories again, just so inspiring to see all that coming through from all over the world. But, you know, the, the stories of, from England and Wales that are just so moving and uh, just really reaffirm why we do what we do really so do i would definitely encourage everyone to uh, to seek it out if you can and, and take a look it's a wonderful publication uh, and we're very proud to be part of it so yeah i i, I think i always think about local area coordination I've, I'm, I'm i'm the new guy i've only been doing this for three years or so um but ever since i came across local area coordination i've never really looked back i, I came from the world of housing and homelessness and services and systems and just knowing that something wasn't quite working right and something wasn't wasn't quite right, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Um, and when I first came across this, I felt this sense of now everything's starting to make sense. I, I can see where, where this is coming from. And ever since then, it's been a really, really interesting journey. But as I say, it's, it's a bit like anyone involved in local area coordination will say, it's a bit like opening a Pandora's box. Once you've seen all that, you, you can't really close it and look back again. It's a, it's a very new way of looking at the world and a very exciting way of looking at the world too. Um, but it is an innovation that is um, can be quite vulnerable uh, and quite difficult to kind of maintain that integrity. Um, and that's what we're about as a network, really trying to support each other to, to do that. In England and Wales, it's led predominantly by, well, it's led entirely by local authorities with their health and uh, wider sort of social care and um, housing system partners in the mix. Um, so it is trying to do something very different to the way, as Eddie described and Ralph described, and Sean was saying very eloquently, the way that things are normally done. At its heart, it's very, very simple. It's very, it's beautifully simple, really. It's about just being in communities, in and of those communities, alongside people, uh, taking introductions from all over the place, not having any barriers to that support, uh, and just starting from that point of what is your vision of a good life and how can we kind of be on that journey together to help you kind of move closer towards it. Recognizing all the networks and assets that exist within your local place has been really rich, meaningful kind of uh, tools to help you kind of move closer to that. But equally, what is your contribution? What are your gifts and talents and skills? And what gets you excited? And how can we, you know, work to a point where you're sharing that with your community in a way that you feel like an included, valued and connected citizen? 
and not someone who feels like a, a, they've been kind of pulled out of their community to be a service user, as Eddie was kind of describing as that original challenge, really. And that, that remains the same challenge. So that, that is a beautiful and simple com concept, but the, 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 the common sense is, is complex, I think, when it, when it comes to kind of designing it. So there's a huge amount of work that goes into actually helping local authorities to implement and design local area coordination in the first place. Big part of that being about bringing the whole system together to try and think about it. What does this mean for all different parts of the, the silo system, different departments, different needs and, and issues that they might be working on? And how can we pool our resources to, to, to work in a very different way with a view on place and those people of that place uh, and starting from that point of having that resource of the local area coordinator in and alongside those, those people, those families, those communities, thinking about the whole picture. Um, so as a network, we routinely kind of reflect on those design features, but also the, the 10 principles that underpin it. Um, how are all these things kind of keeping us going? Um, what, are we, what are we learning as a result of all these, these things that are happening over time? So it's, it's really a, a kind of um, a learning network at its heart and a repository of all sorts of new information that comes out from England and Wales over the last uh, uh, few years of, of this happening. Um, I, I think local area coordination is, is, is a, uh, it can be a beautiful picture, but it takes a lot of different pieces to come together to make that, that picture happen. And if you take away too many pieces of that picture, you really lose sight of that, that vision. And really what we're trying to do is trying to help each other to, to stick to that. And some of those things around like population size, for instance, that's something that can be easily pulled out of shape. The idea being that we try and work with a very community size, neighborhood size, population size of around 10, up to about 10,000. And that's something that this, the, the kind of wider system could easily rationalize and say, well, actually, couldn't we do this at 50,000, 100,000, you know, 150,000 and one local area coordinate for that. So it's how do we have that conversation routinely as a group about why we're not trying to do that and within that network, our wider network, there's loads of sub layers of networks too. So you've got sort of senior leaders, elected members and, and officers, um, managers, local area coordinators themselves, which is over 100 or so now working in England and Wales. And uh, then as a group, we, so I, I work for an organization called Community Catalysts, who became the home of the local area coordination network uh, back in 2018. Um, so we, uh, my job is to, to convene the network and to support the development of it. Um, so we convene things like peer support and, and challenge training, reflective practice, um, celebrating the good stuff that's going on, sharing those stories, uh, bringing people together to, to, to sort of peer challenge, peer support, to share, share the information and, and, and to help each other kind of work through some of these really knotty problems. And whenever we're doing some new development, those members will come in and support. So I can see on this call, we've got you know, people from York here, Joe, and people from Surrey, Rebecca, who, so Joe has been to speak to uh, Surrey and help them stimulate the idea of it and get it going. So as, as a group, we're kind of like a family of people who are really genuinely passionate about this um, and really want to see it flourish. And that was, it's, that's so exciting to feel that energy of working with these people where they just really want this to grow and develop but grow at pace and that pace of trust as well and with the right kind of features in place the right learning and evaluation uh, framework in place um, and taking the time to really do local area coordination right because there are so many parts of it that if you get wrong um, you, you, you can see the effects of that in the, in the design later on. And essentially that's what our network's about, is trying to help each other to, to get that right in a nutshell. Thanks, Nick. I'm always reminded that language, this is, as a philosopher, you're taught language is formed by community. Like, you, you, it, it, you, so that's what you're doing in a way, isn't it? You're, you're really giving meaning to things through a community that can really think through how words have meaning because it's so easy, isn't it, for things to just lose their sense of uh, real function. Um, Sean, I'm mindful that you've got to go in a sec. So I'm just gonna ask another question of you and then we'll circle back around the, the rest of the panel and look at some of the questions that are coming in. But <clears throat> you touched on this and I think that you, you were saying that, you know, it's important not to almost be rushed about it, but I just was thinking about outcomes, you know, from, from your kind of sense of what outcomes are you seeing um, emerge, positive outcomes, I guess, um, but also, you know, what are the outcomes that are worth paying attention to for people who are thinking about researching this? 
Okay, that's a really great question. Um, for, from our experience, obviously, we were tasked with the formative stage, so the first year of local area coordination, but we certainly saw a lot of outcomes. And for our report, you'll see how many recommendations we produced as well. Um, the first thing to say really touches upon Nick's point about the integrity of keeping, I mean, we, we in academic terms, and forgive me, we do refer to local area coordination as a model. I know that's that's not that's not ideal, but it's it's so vital for that to be kept intact. And there's a strong causal link between um, effective in implementation, but also its sustainability and its resilience going forward. And for it to really work that capacity building. So keeping the the model. Um, intact and pure it is really important so that's that's the key thing the reason we saw that is we were also asked to look at other areas in south wales who claim to have similar uh sort of processes to local area coordination but when we delve deeper that wasn't the case and they weren't as resilient or sustainable as local area coordination uh, recruitment that was a real eye opener. So it was it was done by the community by a community panel. They chose their coordinator, and what that allowed was that coordinator to build very rapidly trusted relationships with those people. And then once they were in the role, they were able to springboard them into connections and making introductions. It works so well. So we've seen that time and time again through the recruitment process. Um, and, and because the panel choose them, the trust is automatically there. It's there from a very early stage. And that's really important. Um, role design of the coordinators themselves. So they were given autonomy. They were given excellent training. Um, they have the time to engage and approach a, a sort of a gentle approach uh, over time as required um, and the frequency as well. They have autonomy over the frequency of that relationship. And we were able to show through our data that there is always a concern, isn't there, when you you don't have fixed appointments or you don't say, right, you can have six sessions with a local area coordinator that doesn't exist. So there's always a risk that they could be taken advantage of and end up in the same house time and time again. And that was one of the criticisms that we had. So we were able then to show through our data collection and analysis that that wasn't happening. So that's, that isn't anything to be really concerned about because the data wasn't showing that. Um, but there's no service labels either. And um, we're not fitting square pegs into round holes by telling them what, what they need in their life, you know. Um, the other thing to say is clarity and purpose of local area coordination need to be maintained. People will come and go, leadership will change, but having a good leadership group can often, we call them levers and blockers. So you'll always have blockers, uh, when you have uh, new ideas coming in or um, people who are not really on board with things. So you need the levers and the leadership group certainly provided the, le the levers. And they were from all over. So they were from uh, the emergency services, from housing, social housing, et cetera. Um, and they became really valuable in embedding local area coordination into the communities, but also communicating as well that what it was about and, and the good work it was doing. Um, and there was also wonderful opportunity for joint working and shared outcomes and really celebrating that. Uh, and that was leading then to these conversations around co-funding coordinators. So those are our initial um, sort of discoveries but you can see how transformative they are. Um, and yeah, as soon as I've done my summative evaluation in Swansea, I'll be reporting in, and I'm sure there'll be a lot more to be discussing, but those are the key ones, I think, Simon. 
That's great. Thank you. That's really helpful. So there's a few really good questions coming up in, in the chat. So um, now I'm going to direct this one to Eddie um, for, for, well, I'm not quite sure what you're going to say about it. <laughs> the question was, do you know if the model is being used in Scotland? And um, I mean, I remember when you came to Scotland, because that's where I worked in the uh, late 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's a bit of a story, I think, um, about the, ref the response to what some of the other issues that Sean's talking on here, isn't that? Because that, that's an example yeah. of, I think, where a government got excited by the concept, but didn't necessarily put in very much thought into how yeah. to bring that to life. Could you say a little yeah. bit about that? I, I don't mean to be rude to anybody in particular. Nobody's got personal responsibility for this. <laughs> now, happy to, and then maybe uh, Ralph's had some more recent contacts, he can jump in as well. So, um, so you're right, Scotland were very excited about um, the outcomes, the evidence, what they wanted to achieve. Um, but the way in which things work in Scotland was they put out a guidance and they allowed local authorities to choose what they did. And so um, when they did the national evaluation of local coordination in Scotland, you had this variation from the, the quite extremely brilliant <laughs> right through to something which was indistinguishable from uh, other, other services. And so I think the key learning there was that unless there's sort of clarity around the integrity of the approach, if people just pick and choose parts of it, you don't get all the outcomes. And so um, this was a very, very key learning for us. And so, um, so Ralph, I might just sort of pass on to you because um, there's, there's the good and the, and the not so good of what we've done. And as, as important to learn about what's gone off the rails as it is to learn about what's worked. So Ralph, do you want to? Um... Yeah, yeah, thanks Eddie. Uh, yeah, but as part of writing the book, uh, we did, did a lot of uh, re-looking at all the evaluations that have happened in the last, 33 years. And one of the clear, uh, clear recommendations from uh, Scottish government was uh, that there did need to be greater clarity, consistency over the design and implementation or delivery of local error coordination because 32 local authorities have sort of been done in 32 different ways, a couple of which were spectacularly good. Uh, I remember being involved in the, uh, in, uh, with uh, Archie Rose in Stirling. Stirling was a wonderful local error coordination area, absolutely brilliant. Um, others, really good people trying their best, but have been pulled out of shape. And once it's pulled out of shape, it's really hard to deliver community focused, strength based, intentional work. You become more reactive and service driven again. Um, there's still some uh, really good people doing local error coordination in Scotland. Um, most are quite in shape, even with what was designed 20 years ago, but uh, definitely not thinking about this much more inclusive whole system approach at the moment. But there's some really interesting conversations emerging with uh, Scottish government and a number of local authorities that are, are doing a version of local coordination who would like to now move to the much, uh, the more inclusive whole community, whole system approach. And there's a couple of areas not doing local coordination that would also like to explore it. Um, and uh, I've just received an email from some uh, NHS colleagues as well, uh, looking for some information about local coordination and integration and health outcomes. So it's really positive conversations. It's quite difficult to move from something that's been pulled out of shape to pull it back into shape and then pull it into something new and inclusive, um, you know, from a, a service specific or service label approach to a whole community approach. It's, it's a bit of a journey, but it's actually quite an exciting one. So I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful, really good people, really innovative people in Scotland who would like to move into this space that actually delivers many of the aspirations of Scottish policy and strategy and, uh, at, that, at that senior level. Um, so I'm really hopeful, really positive. There's a question from Mark John Williams, who I know very well as kind of a leader around person-centered planning um, and inclusion in Wales. I thought was an interesting question as well. So Mark is asking about, um, I think, the, the relationship between local area coordination and concepts like the development of a circle around folk and the way in which circles can be used as a kind of intentional approach to growing community and better support and better inclusion. Um, I suppose that also touches on just the relationship between local area coordination and kind of 
other good stuff as well that's going on or and and the kind of issues of boundaries a little bit i'm not quite sure who who's the best person to respond to that question um it seems like um a good question but i don't know whether um nick or ralph or eddie particularly might any one of you i'll make a quick start if that's okay um uh, Simon, just because this links with some of the uh, the earlier evaluations. So uh, Ch Chad Oatley uh, on Isle of Wight and Southampton Solent University, just about the relationship bit. So, so firstly, relationships, uh, natural reciprocal relationships uh, are a centre point of local coordination. I think it's the bit that makes everything else tick. And uh, in the Southampton Solent first evaluation, they called uh, relationships the golden thread of everything that else that happens. The absence of relationships is such a problem um, that drives inequality of all sorts, health and social care determinants, uh, exclusion, uh, a lack of a voice. Um, so there's the, the building of uh, intentional relationship networks and contribution is a fundamental building block of local area coordination. And it's one of the things, which is why it's so great that Sean and the team there did some very, very intensive looking at if, if it's fundamental, what is it delivering in terms of relationships, personal relationships, community relationships lead to community action. Um, so yes, the answer to that first bit is it's fundamental, it's intentional and it's vital. I'll leave Nick and Sean and Eddie to follow up from that. Is anybody... There's, there's another question I'm just going to throw in the mix as well. So you can make, because I think it's also, this is also about an interaction with D Darius is asking a question about also what role you might see for digital technology in this as well. So in a sense, that's an, another emerging kind of approach, isn't it? Which is changing the world in which local area coordination operates. The world doesn't stay static. And that's one of the challenges for thinking about the meaning of integrity. So that might be something else people might have a reflection on. Um, anybody want to respond to any aspect of that? We can, Nick. Yeah, I'll say a couple of words. Um, so that, your first question there about um, other innovations in this uh, world, I think we, and certainly in England and Wales, work really hard to connect with, with other good stuff going on um, and try and understand it. Um, we have uh, regular local area coordinator gatherings online where we invite people from um, who are leading other things to come and talk about their work so we can understand that better. One of the principles of local area coordination is, is about working together uh, and as Ralph was saying about those relationships. So a local area coordinator is, is no use if they don't have really good uh, knowledge and connections with all the wonderful stuff that's going on in their local area and, and around it. <clears throat> so it's really important that we have a, a sight of that, but also so that we can learn and adapt and uh, collaborate really effectively as well. And I think that's really important. So we're, we're involved in all sorts of other networks beyond our own network um, and all, all the constituent local authorities who make up the local area coordination network are, are part of other networks too. So we really try and, 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 and um, learn uh, and engage collaboratively as, as much as we can really because we, we do strongly believe that that's that's a really important principle and, and one that's that's fundamental to it working um so um the second question about sort of digital i think is a really really interesting question i think it's something we haven't um started to explore yet uh within our network much i think it's something we're starting to see emerge a lot within the realm of social care obviously and we're starting to see the impact of that on people that local area coordinators are alongside, both positively and, and negatively. So one of the things I think is how do local area coordinators respond to that uh, in, in a way that's, you know, how, how is that new tech complementary to the natural authority of that individual for them to live their good life? And how can a local area coordinator help ensure that that person is still central to all of that and that tech is, is, is supportive of that um, rather than it been something that sort of takes away that natural relationship that may have been in place or something where you think we can just strip that back now that we have this. But interestingly, I think throughout COVID, we've seen a lot of local area coordination go online, especially in the first lockdown where we couldn't physically be with people. So a lot of those conversations started to happen online, over the phone, um, and, and in that way. And, and some of that has continued. Um, a lot of people have actually said that this is how they prefer to have that conversation, that relationship with their local area coordinator. 
And I think for us, historically, we'd always just thought it has to be in the community, it has to be uh, in people's homes, it has to be in, in their local community, in a, somewhere meet, somewhere like that. So I think um, we've learned that actually by having that, perhaps that slightly skew on what that value of being physically present with someone, we may have been overlooking that conversation about what, in terms of choice and control, what is, how, how do you want this relationship to look like? And could some of that be done through uh, connecting online um, rather than in, in the real world? So it's a it's a it's an interesting one. I think it's a it's a risky one in some ways uh, for us, and I think we're exploring it with 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 caution. But um, it's certainly I think a lot of the drivers coming out of social care at the moment will will impact on people's lives, and then it's how does local area coordination adapt around that? Really, um, in a nutshell. Cool. Hey, hey, Simon, can I jump in just on both of those? Um, just a real grassroots one. So when I was um, director of local area coordination, just at a, a very grassroots level, you'd be having the conversations with uh, individuals and families about the importance of family, friends, and making a contribution, and you know, sort of, uh, and how the more people around you help you with a bigger vision and you know a better plan and all that sort of stuff. So we sort of got interested in different ways in which people might start to think about and organise, you know, uh, around that idea. And so we would um, bring in people to talk about circles, microboards, networks, all those ideas, and not just um, bring them in to talk to the local area coordinators. We brought them in for the individuals and families and everybody, pretty much. So then it became this next layer of those that were interested in that. We then created various you know, opportunities for people to go deeper because there's no one size fits everyone. And so some people went microboards, other, other went networks and you know, so um, so electric coordination is a bit of a springboard for that, and and a, and a nice use of technology is there's um, there's a network technology around circles that uses technology, and like a little Google room for people to organise meetings, um, you know, um, arrangements to provide support for an individual, so the network can keep in touch and they can do that sort of virtually. And it's sort of it's like an aid to the functioning of the network. And so it's, it's a program called TYZE, T Y Z E, coming out of Canada. So it's actually like a, you know a further extension about what people can do to use that to support their uh, network of support. Thanks, Eddie. And I think that's really important, isn't it? Because I don't think I think one of the great things about local area coordination is it's not pretending to be a panacea. It, it is a bridge to the different things that people might need, and it, it doesn't assume because the whole, in a sense challenges that we're, we kind of know that our communities and our public services as they're currently configured are not functioning well for lots of people. So we have to think about kind of systemic change and community change as, as part of the process, don't we? But the local air coordination is that kind of, uh, that, uh, that fulcrum point maybe for the way change is managed. Um, those are, uh, those, um, I'm mindful of just picking up some of these almost slightly techie questions that I think are quite interesting. Uh, and, and, and Ross has asked a couple of questions, but one, I, I do think this, this always intrigued me, so I'm going to kind of ask my version of Ross's question, is the issue of like the accountability of who the local area coordinator is, who's managing them, who's recruiting them, um, because that has varied a little bit, hasn't it? And, and um you know, and in certain contexts, you've been local area coordination has been challenged to respond in slightly different ways. Would somebody like to speak to that whole issue of kind of, I mean, who 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 does the local area coordinator belong to in a way is, which is a that's an unfairly sharp way of putting it. I'm happy to kick off. If that's right. So I'll be speaking from a, a England, Wales, and. A, Singapore context and, and Isle of Man. So I, I suppose uh, it's, it's a bit of a broad question to answer because lots of things underneath that create conditions for good outcomes. And one of the outcomes we want is a system that's much more connected and uh, with, it, with itself and more connected with the community and that type of stuff. Uh, I think the evidence has shown us really clearly that if you want some of this, not only the people, family, community outcomes, but also more responsive service outcome and more personal flexible local service system um, where it's hosted suddenly becomes really important and our learning has been absolutely crystal clear uh, that where it's hosted in the system as well as being embedded in the community so two things are happening embedded in the system embedded in the community you're creating space and shape 
for both the transformational stuff, but actually delivering stuff alongside people in the community. Uh, so sort of a when is a service, not a service type conundrum. Uh, where it's been commissioned out, it's been much less successful because of the disconnection with services and into a contracted uh, commissioner type role. Have you done this? And it, it sort of eliminates innovation and creativity. It's, it's, uh, there might be ways of mitigating that in the future, but we're quite interested in that. Then there's an next bit about the system's quite big. Um, and one of our things is how do we bring it together? So although it might be hosted in one part of the system, we want to make sure the rest of the system is connected to it. So it's, it might be hosted by one, but accountable to all and including accountable to the community as well. So it should be some form of, of community leadership alongside whole system leadership. The, the, uh, so in, in England, uh, yeah, in England and Wales, I truly do this. There's hosted by adult services, public health, uh, community provision, uh, Singapore, it's run by health. Um, in Western Australia, it was run by Department of Communities. So there's a whole range of things, but then they're pulled together as part of a, another system. The new, new program on the Isle of Man, it's a whole government responsibility. So it's not just health and social care, because integration is about much more than health and social care. They're just two bits of people's lives. People's lives are much bigger than that. So it's including a whole range of government department leaders and community and third sector organisations all working together to take ownership of and contribution to this very community facing resilience building approach. I'll, I'll stop there. Does anybody else want to just comment? Because this is quite an important issue about implementation, isn't it? I mean, Eddie, do you want to say a little bit about this? Yeah, I, I guess I've seen every version from, you know, sort of back in the early days, the West Australian Government Disability Services Commission hosted and ran local area coordination very intentionally and used that as the lever to really bring the information in and change the system. So it was very intentional. Uh, I've seen uh, versions where it's been contracted out to NGOs. I guess what I would say is you've got then got the additional challenge of, um, of different NGOs and different partners providing something and you've got the question of consistency and consistency of quality. And then you've also got the risk that it becomes a, dis, a more distant contract management arrangement as opposed to a, a more integrated you know, free flow of information back and forward. And so I think the language I would use would be if you're going to contract it out to, to NGOs or to um, multiple providers, you've got to be a lot more intentional around the network approach and about how you're going to safeguard consistency and quality. And then the last, the worst thing you want to do is just leave it to contract manager to manage it because you lose all, you know, you lose the intelligence, you lose the engagement. It becomes something that somebody else is doing and not, you know, an integral part of the overall strategy. So, um, yeah, so I think, I think we've, got, we've got to deal with multiple realities. You know, the key is if you, if, you, if you put it out externally, you need more safeguards. Nick, what about your, what's your perspective on this from an England and Wales point of view? Yeah, it's a big question that comes up every time we're looking at developing a new area. And um, I think it's a really important conversation to be having. Um, I'm constantly kind of uh, revisiting it, but uh, certainly, to, I mean, I wouldn't want to sort of just uh, repeat what Eddie and Ralph have said, because I think that's all spot on, obviously, but um, just to add in, I think for me, it's about which part of our system needs to really learn uh, and, and where are those opportunities for these insights to affect that change. And I think if local area coordination is felt like it has some sense of direct link ownership within that system that needs to change, which in our instance in England and Wales is local authorities, the wider health and care system, um, then that is, I think, can be a really positive thing if done well. It has to, it's all part of the wider design and everything. But if you've got a leadership group that's made up of a really reflective mix of people from across the system, system leaders who are thinking about doing things differently, local people, organisations, VCS, all coming together to think about place and the people in those places, and how can we build this up and spread this over time? So the logic being you start small and you grow in England and Wales, certainly. Um, then you've got a real opportunity there to gain new insights, a real rich understanding and um, and do some do something really proactive with that in, in real time as well. Not have to wait two years for data and information to come out and then make decisions based on that. But actually, what is it that people are saying? What works and what doesn't? What could we do differently tomorrow? And let's go and do it. And I think actually during COVID that we that was kind of all over the country that was kind of, you know 
accelerated but certainly where there was a sort of low, local area coordination leadership group in place they were thinking right we've got these people in these communities we know what communities can do because we've got these relationships already in place we've invested heavily in building these relationships let's not duplicate what local people can do for themselves let's do what we can do well and use this link with the local area coordinator to, to keep those connections flowing and going so I think they inhabit a very interesting place in between community and the sort of state. And I think that's an interesting gray area. And there's lots of interesting things that can come out of that. But I think the question someone put in the chat around, does this kind of present barriers for relationships building with local groups and people? Um, that I think is a really valid question. And I think, yes, it could do that if, if the local area coordinator was restricted in the way they could work. But if we've done that, then something's gone wrong in the design. So it all goes back to that point, really, of lots and lots of investment in conversations and, and discussions. And so I'm working with Surrey at the moment and, and Nottinghamshire and just investing huge amounts of time in having conversations with all sorts of different parts of the system, different levels, different local communities where these local area coordinators are, are starting. Before getting to the point, local people helping to shape that, obviously going to recruit their first local area coordinators. But actually, if you, if you kind of really kind of put a lot of energy into that then you can really start to get people together and think right what's this about how, how can we make this work and actually see the value in it and the complementary aspect of it rather than it being seen as something that duplicates or replicates or something that's going to steal resource from over there or assets stripped from there or all these sorts of problems that people kind of foresee sometimes with with new innovations coming to the system so i think if you can keep everyone centered on the person the family the community and this is about helping people to move closer towards their vision of a good life. And that's the starting point and try and keep those very simple ideas in people's minds. Then it doesn't really matter where it sits. But actually, I think if it does sit within uh, the local authority, that's where you can see that start to influence the culture change within that wider uh, organization, which I think personally is where, where, it, where it needs to shift within, within this country. So anyway. So Darius has asked another question, which I think is a good, I'm going to ask it, uh, this question because I think it's quite a good way into, again, some of the more technical aspects and the question of how local area coordination has evolved. And then I'm going to start shifting to some of the more strategic questions that some other folk have asked. But I think this question, I think Darius is asking um, about the ratio of local area coordination to people. Um, but your understanding of this, I think my understanding was, I think somebody said one to 10,000 um, people um, and, and 10,000 being, in my mind, kind of two neighbourhoods, because we kind of roughly a neighbourhood being about 5,000 is what the neighbourhood democracy movement would probably say. Uh, but these are all very rough figures anyway. Um, but these things must have evolved a little bit because when local area coordination started, it worked specifically with people with intellectual disabilities, didn't it, Eddie, um, in Western Australia? And now, I think this, so it's important, I think, to explore this. It's, it's now a much broader um, intervention or strategy. So, um, Eddie, maybe you'd like to talk a lot about that, the evolution of this, and, and, and Ralph and Nick could pick up from that. Yeah, no, that, that's good. And it's interesting, um, over the last few years, Nick and Ralph and I have been sort of talking about the metrics of this and trying to understand. Um, so I think one way of describing this would be we went from a narrower target group and a much deeper involvement with that population to one where it's a broader population and uh, probably the reach into that population doesn't go quite as far. So it's so it's positioned a bit more at the preventative early intervention, so early support end, and a little little less so around people with more critical or more significant needs. That's being a little bit blunt, you know, and it's also to do with the positioning of other services as well, you know. So um, so the people in England and Wales have been, I think, hugely skillful in um, not setting these local area coordinators up to fail and to be swamped by, you know, every service just, you know, handing over their list. Uh, it's been a very disciplined partnership approach where local area coordinators have been introduced and it's been a slow introduction and uh, it's, it's been very skillful. So, um, so I might start there. So, so Ralph and Nick, do you want to... Um... Yeah, so I suppose when we first started in England and Wales, uh, I built everything on the evidence of what happened before, basically in Western Australia and and um, and, and Scotland mainly. 
Um, and then we did start to think about if, if, if the idea that the community is the source, the richest possible source of relationships, opportunities, contribution, and, and solutions to many, many, many problems that services can't solve. Um, suddenly, the, our knowledge of connection with and contribution to those communities becomes vital. If that's the case, the next logical bit is how big is too big? How small is too small? If it's too small, it's too expensive, bluntly. How, how do we afford this? But actually, if the, if the community is too big, we can't possibly get to know the people, the places, the resources, the opportunities, uh, and then help to mobilize that so it's more accessible for people who are excluded for whatever reason, for whatever their service label is, their circumstance, their culture, their spoken language. Um, and we start off finger in the air, to be honest. We said, okay, let's think about ward level, 14 to 16,000. Uh, sounds okay. We learned really quickly, actually, that um, and this is, Eddie told me, follow the metrics. We, we did the evaluations. We learned that uh, in many places, the, the demand was really high. Well, that's for lots of reasons, which needs lots of analysis as well. But we did start to see this sort of sweet spot, I think, in the last two or three years, that up to about 10,000 appears about right. Now, this is acknowledging that every community is different. So we could be very careful and pay attention to rural communities or remote communities or island communities. So it's not a fixed thing. Again, it's got to be very intentional. But that appears to be that sweet spot that gives us good knowledge of and connection with communities so it can be of high value to people who might be excluded from communities and isolated, lonely, uh, or, or, or finding difficult, you know, difficulties in solving some of their problems and therefore only able to access services if they're eligible, which is another story in itself. So that, that's sort of how we came to, to that. And we're, we're continuing to, to, to look at that and then think about what's, um, what's the maximum number of people that a local or coordinator who do have long-term complex issues they're facing, what's sort of the maximum number before you suddenly become just reactive service deliverer? How do you still maintain that uh, capacity building approach, helping someone to need those services they're already dependent on less? Uh, and uh, so we've got some numbers around that. We think somewhere between 30 and 40 is, is about right. Um, and that's a combination of people in, in crisis with uh, joint working with other services. Other people have been through that and we're just helping them to tick along. Not, there's not dependency, but we're available. We're helping them to continue to build their capacity. And there's some people that sort of bobble between. There's in the short term bit, this really high level prevention stuff, which is really important. Um, people talk about prevention, but actually don't really invest in it. But prevention is the big one. Uh, and uh, I was speaking to Neil from Derby a few months ago, and he talked about local coordinators might do some small, beautiful, short term capacity building stuff with hundreds of people per month. Uh, one small intentional relationship building with someone else. Uh, can be transformational for someone. Uh, a connection to a faith group can be absolutely amazing for a person who has, who's moved into the community but known, knows nobody but is a person of faith. Not just connecting and signposting because they're very limited and, and quite often don't work, but intentional relationship development can be small and beautiful. So getting that balance right and maintaining connection with community, we're trying to balance those three things at the same time. And it's all a bit of a numbers game and we're, and we're learning as we move forward. It's very helpful. Nick, do you want to add anything from your perspective now in the midst of this in England? Yeah, I think that uh, this is just all the wisdom I received from Ralph when I started, you know, and just how important that is to get that right and not let that kind of get pulled out of shape. I think for every area where we've seen local area coordination come to an end, which there have been a few, that population size has been out of shape at that point. Um, there hasn't been a leadership group in place at that point. There's uh, two consistent things that seem to be um, part of the erosion of the approach, or certainly uh, there's a correlation between those things and local area coordination coming to an end or, or changing. So I think that's really important. And again, one of the you know points around integrity and trying to hold hold true to that, but equally involving local people in, in shaping what that that community boundary looks like. And again, Ralph said to me you know some people might say there's a there's a massive road there that that separates you know we wouldn't even think that that's part of our community so unless you're kind of out there having these conversations with people um from the early stages of, you know you've identified that that is going to be roughly the area um because it's very important i think to not kind of go in and over promise to people that we're going to bring you a local area coordinator and then nothing happens because that's you know that can happen as well get that wrong 
but if, if at that stage you're kind of saying well where would you say was the natural boundary of your local area and what would we kind of work out being the population size and that using the data available within the system then that that feels like the right thing for us to do um and it's something we're working trying to get really smart on and not just use wards because you know wards i think the population size is out of kilter and also it's a meaningless geographical boundary um it's a political boundary it doesn't make sense to I mean, I don't know what water I live in, but I, so I think it's uh, that's important to to kind of get all that bit right, really, because it's a big part of the, the design. Yeah. Hey, Simon, can I quickly say that um, with this emerging work in Singapore with uh, Asian health, so think of Singapore, it's an island city of six million people on an island for UK people. It's about 20 percent bigger than the size of the Isle of Man. Um, <laughs> And we're actually, uh, we've had conversations again with uh, our, our service colleagues and our communities to think about uh, what would this look like for local people in, in a very densely populated city on an island. So there's multiple issues here. Island communities are different from mainland communities. A city island is something completely unique. Um, and uh, actually at the moment, it's very early days, but the 10,000 appears to be uh, quite good. There's lots of interconnections between local coordinators and the spaces outside of their area because there's other local coordinators. So this is the beauty when you when you when you grow local coordination, maintaining the efficacy around um, size of population, uh, and you've got people with intense in-depth knowledge of a, of a locality, and you've got other people with intense knowledge right next to you. So the the co-working of local coordinators because people go across boundaries all the time. This really intimate knowledge of local coordinate of, of local areas is really powerful when you're alongside people who are uh, struggling to move forward or wanting to move forward with life who would otherwise be waiting for services. Um, so there's, yeah, something very intentional and very careful needs to be thought out. Uh, the logic is again, if you think about my logic before, if we're if it's a population of a certain size, you're connected and you understand it. When people say, "Oh gosh, if you got," uh, if we could have one local coordination to, to 150,000, the outcomes would be 15 times better. Of course it's not, they diminish really quickly because you're completely disconnected. So the value for money drops. And this is a good financial benefit of value for money if you're thoughtful and intentional around the delivery. So, um, hey, so, so, so sorry, sorry, idea. I mean, just quickly, it's sort of like, um, you know, I think language is really important. So what we learned with the WA Department of Communities, where they went to a much broader population group, homelessness, child protection, domestic violence, older, like very broad. Um, this sort of starting small and personal introductions as opposed to mass marketing and referrals and all that sort of stuff, like this seemed to be a very skillful, artful way of doing it. And they managed this process incredibly well. They were very, very skillful. And so it was just part, part of it was the approach, which was, you know, person by person, locality by locality, personal introductions, connections, you know, careful sort of partnerships with the services. So um, so this is a bit more of an art form, I think, and, and very, very skillful. So, it, so it's not just in a sense the, the integrity of the concept, but it's the integrity of the implementation yes, is really yes. important. Yeah, okay. So, I'm sorry, when Sean talked about the levers and obstacles, for change in outcomes, these are the conditions that we're thinking of. This is the implementation stuff, isn't it? That uh, you need to be very, very thoughtful about behavior, practice, everything in between. They're the conditions that enhance or, or obstruct outcomes and, and people leave, leading their own lives and systems benefiting. If we get in the way, we can damage something that's very, very logical and very personal and very human. Um, so yeah. So I'm going to ask, so um, we've got a 15 minutes left and I want to make sure that each of you gets the chance to kind of summarize some key points. And I'd encourage you to look at some of the questions if there's any way of threading responses in. But there are a couple of questions early on from uh, Bruce and Deborah that I'm going to integrate into one broad question that for, and ask you each to think about. So Deborah was really asking, you know, what are the pressures um, or the obstacles that you, you face in terms of good implementation of local area coordination? And, and Bruce was asking, well, and who does local area coordination as a concept belong to? Like, and obviously that's a hugely 
big question, isn't it? But the but I think you've got some answers for that. So that's why I'm asking you, you know, how and how do you in a world where people can run off and call anything they like local area coordination, I guess, how do you actually maintain that integrity grow globally? Um, I think the book is actually part of trying to answer that, in my opinion. But um, maybe you want to kind of build on that a little bit and respond to the general force, maybe, of Deborah and Bruce's questions around where are we going from here? What are we learning? And, and what's the strategy, given the way the world is at the moment? Joe McKayley, who had to leave, has also asked about, you know, traditional service responses kicking back in at this point now. And, you know, it's that kind of pressure, I suppose. So, um, you know, maybe maybe I'll ask um, Eddie to start because, you know, you've been on this journey so long, Eddie. Um, and then and then Ralph and Nick could come come in on the back of that. Yeah, so, OK, so maybe I'll sort of come at this in two ways. So one is, um, you know, one of the chapters in the book sort of teases out research evidence and what we know about integrity and sustainability. And so we've tried to pull that together. So into what we call the building blocks and we say, OK, what the evidence is that in terms of initial design, implementation and then sustainability, there's a bunch of stuff that we've got to do, you know. And so in some ways, I feel as though it's as clear cut as that, you know. And for an example would be one of the key design things is around the role being an integrated role, you know, based in local community, as opposed to some people look at the role and say it's a bunch of activities and we'll have three separate people doing those activities and we're doing local area coordination, you know. So, um, so in many ways, that's simply not true. <laughs> They're doing a bunch of activities, but they lack the integrity of the connectedness of the activities and the connection to community. So, so I guess I would say, you know, um, we know the things that people do that go wrong. We know the positive things that people need to do. So we've tried to be really clear about those as building blocks that people can think about. Secondly, why we're so um, important about this network idea is, you know, we think local area coordination is, is something wonderful if done with, with integrity and it's best done through uh, a broad international network and solid technical support. And one of the things that the England Whale people have done that was incredibly smart is they've kept a rein on who can say they're doing local area coordination. They can do whatever they like, just don't call it local area coordination. Whereas we've got other people that are calling things local area coordination that if you went through the building blocks are probably missing half of them. You know, so, so I think sort of going forward, I would say, you know, look, I'm really passionate about the values of local area coordination, but for me, it's the evidence and the building blocks. What do we know about what you need to do? And then secondly, we'll do this better if we do it together and that we value deep technical support for people starting on the journey. Thanks, Eddie, that's very helpful. Nick, maybe you'd like to um, respond as to that kind of challenge and, and build on what Eddie said. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, there's a really, really strong points. And I think, again, that one of the main rationales for being a network and thinking and acting as a network is to try and stay true to that, but also to perhaps reduce the likelihood of the name becoming just used in different ways, which is something we're trying to avoid because we want the name to be synonymous with those design features and the principles that underpin it. And that's part of a journey and part of a wider family and collective of, of people trying to, to drive this forward. So that, that's the rationale there. And actually in England and Wales, it's interesting that that doesn't happen so much. There isn't many kind of instances of people calling something local area coordination out with the kind of the kind of uh, group of, of, of how we work. So which is, I think, testament to, to us trying to work collaboratively to, as a group to, to stop that from happening, really, I guess. Um, but I think that is one of the main pressures and obstacles is how do you get this kind of going with, but also I think people are looking for very quick solutions to things at the moment, understandably. Uh, you know, we've got some really kind of pressing socioeconomic challenges in this country right now, and people are desperate for solutions. And I would always um, be very hesitant to try and suggest that look, Clary coordination is a quick fix for anything. I think you could, you could fairly early on see some interesting outcomes, but actually this is a long-term kind of capacity building approach, which is about thinking differently, doing things differently. And I think you can have the crisis response and the capacity building stuff at the same time. I don't think those two things need to be separate. I think we can think in two, two kind of mindsets around this at the same 
point. And we saw that, I think, during the last 14 months, 15 months of COVID. And Joe's point, though, as well, is, is the social care system going to snap back again? Are we going to revert to type or, or worse? And I think um, that's a really kind of interesting one and a big, big challenge and a big obstacle. Um, as more and more people may fall into some point of crisis in their lives, is the expectation on the state going to be that we're going to have to somehow respond to that and solve that? Well, actually, why aren't we thinking how do we kind of work with the energy of local communities and people to build on that now in a really meaningful way so that people can, communities can become self-supporting places that are inclusive and welcoming, you know, the, the full vision of local area coordination. So one of the obstacles I think is, is short-termism and the pressure of budgets and the pressure of uh, COVID and the kind of many, many issues that we're facing right now. Um, and the kind of the, the major social care crisis in this country that's happening. I mean, it's, it can't be overlooked, but this is this is enormous, absolutely enormous. Um, and I think local area coordination is feeling some of that, that pressure, to be honest, as well. And it's interesting to see the dif different areas at different stages of their journey of how they kind of respond to that in England and Wales. Um, I think the, the sort of thing around um, who does it belong to, the question around who does it belong to, for me, it's always that local area coordinator is accountable to that individual there alongside and their family and the wider community. And that's fundamentally important and that needs to be enshrined through a shared agreement and some sort of kind of agreement between the, them and that person as to who, who's going to do what what the point of that relationship is as it emerges over time. And that's really important. But I think being part of that local authority system, part of that um, health, wider health and social care system means that they can walk in that world too. They, they've got to be bilingual, I always say. They've got to be able to be alongside local people and families and groups and be rooted in that community, but also equally be able to understand the complexity of the systems, the way they work, they don't work, to be able to challenge that in the right way at the right time, to be able to have those conversations. And that's why I think fundamentally for me, it's important that it um, sits also within that system um, because it's got to have this foot in both worlds. Um, but in terms of who it belongs to, it's got to belong to the people of that local area, that community, the people there alongside. And I think that's fundamentally what needs to remain central at the local area coordinator's mind whenever they're starting a relationship with someone, that this is a privilege. They've been invited into that individual's life um, and they've got to tread very, very carefully and walk alongside them. Don't try and fix, don't do too much. Just be in the moment with people, listen, build that relationship and take the time to do that. And all the system behind them and all the leadership behind them and all that sort of stuff has got to give them the space to do that. And I think that's what's fundamental importance part of the design and those building blocks that Eddie's talking about. Because all of that leads up to just that clearing of the space, the way that actually those local area coordinators are allowed to, to work in that very kind of flexible and autonomous way, because that's what people want. It's what we would want if we needed that in our lives. Many of us do, our family members do, and many of you may do. We want that personal relationship. We want that conversation. We want that local thinking and uh, resource uh, available on our doorstep. And we want that introduction to be able to come from our family member or our, our neighbor or our community leader or, or anywhere. It doesn't, we don't want to be extracted out of our community in order to have to access that, that system. Um, so yeah. Those are some reflections on those questions. That's really powerful and helpful, Nick. Thank you. And Ralph, and I'm mindful we've got about six minutes left, and I have a question for each of you tucked up my sleeve. So, but Ralph, do you, I mean, there's a lot already said, but did you want to comment on this? Oh, look, I'll be really quick, I promise. I agree with all that came before, and I, I suppose there's something about as As we're working alongside leaders and communities to uh, design, develop, and implement local coordination, I suppose that there's that thing around, I, I picked this up from Eddie in the early days, building a shared vision for what it is we want in, in our communities, for ourselves, and in our service, services. So absolute clarity about what we're trying to achieve is really important. Then we can start to think about what are the range of ways we, we can go about doing that, what's in place, uh, and where does local coordination uh, fit, contribute, and drive change as well? How do we make the most of this? So that it brings mutual benefits across the service system and within community. So it's very intentional stuff. That's probably linked with the technical support that Eddie's talking about. Let's work on this together to use the evidence to build something that's locally bespoke, but built on these core principles to drive uh, people-led change. Uh, that's, I think that's just very intentional stuff. Again, common word, local coordination, intentionality. So thanks all of you. And so, I mean, I think, and I would say if, 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 if you want to, 
uh, you should also think about how you use citizen network to support what you're doing because i think actually citizen network supports a number of different similar kind of parallel innovations and my qu last question really for all three of you is rooted in the work we're doing at the moment to develop the neighborhood democracy movement so at the moment there are people in communities who are kind of saying actually this thing this neighborhood we want it to be more real it isn't real enough it isn't powerful enough it isn't democratic enough it doesn't have enough resources or control over the resources and a whole set of things i'm not going to give a whole lecture on that subject <laughs> but if if you were speaking not so much as being challenged by those people but i think you've got something to offer to neighborhoods in a way um and so if you're what would your message be and so giving yourselves each just a minute to kind of give a final message to the world about the use of the importance of or strategies for you know what would you want to say to to all of us who belong in neighborhoods because that's where we all are at some part of our lives what's your message to us um i don't know yeah like uh, i think you yeah. should go first yeah uh, uh, look, I, I'd probably go back to if you, if you do have this sort of deep conversation about a good life for all of us, um, you know, value relationships and opportunities to make a contribution and having choice and control, all those things are really vitally important um, to us. And the fact is that formal services can't deliver many of those things. They can do some things, but, you know, the most important things in our lives come from our relationships and our communities. And so... You know, this is about what people can do themselves together and then the complementary space of the service system. You know, so, so I think the main conversation is about like the place of the service system is to complement and add value, not to take over from ordinary citizens. So that's that's really where I would start. Thanks, Eddie. Um, Nick. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I would just add that I think community-led solutions are uh, increasingly going to be the only option I think in this country certainly and I think we need to be thinking very carefully and quickly about what resource we need in order to make that that work in our local areas so that would be what I would say is thinking about where is the power in in our local communities right now and is that fit for purpose for I think the level of kind of some of the challenges that we're going to be expected to respond to and how do we do that in a way that's collaborative in place to the strengths of the entire system rather than it being a kind of um uh expectation of a failed sort of system or state that this communities just need to pick up that, that slack because ultimately i think what would end up happening is those things would be re replicated in the way that it's always happened we don't want that so how do we work collaboratively now very quickly recognizing that we've got a big big challenge on the horizon really and think about building capacity at the same time as responding to, to crisis thanks nick ralph 30 seconds or less i can do this simon <laughs> I, I was really inspired by some of the early western australian evaluations and I, I remember clearly there's one bit in there that local people feeding back that communities are stronger and richer and better places to live through the inclusion of people who would otherwise be excluded. Um, and I think through that, understanding that everyone has something to offer mm -hmm. and part of this beautiful connected part of local coordination, so alongside people uh, in, in the way we're supposed to be, but, but also that connection with the community and understanding all the community has to offer and helping everyone to be part of mobilizing that and still respecting the, uh, the, the, the power of services in the right place at the right time. Uh, I think that real, real understanding, but that bit that communities are stronger and better for the inclusion of everyone and contribution of everyone was something that stayed with me for 20 years. Well, that's a fantastic point to end, isn't it? Because that's what this is about, isn't it? It's, it's not about just, as it were, paternalistically saying we want to take care of people. It's actually we're missing out people's contribution. Our communities are weaker through that. And local area coordination is a thoughtful, balanced, well-designed, uh, potentially well-implemented social innovation that can help us make citizenship and community real. So that goes back to my question right, right at the beginning I was asked to ask myself, which is why do we support a citizen network local area coordination? It's precisely because uh, it's, it's on the money of what the challenge is today. 
just to make sure, you know, everybody does matter, but it doesn't feel like it sometimes in our communities. It doesn't feel like we're respecting the value of everyone. And so um, it's fantastic that you've built on those early innovations. You've not let go and you've, you've continued to build the evidence. You've continued to adapt and think differently. So I just want to give a big thank you, remind everybody that this book is available in physical form. Uh, sometime in 2022, we will make an electronic version of it available also. So those of you who just can't bring yourselves to buy a book, that's okay. We will, we will make the information available. Um, we, we are just over time. So I just want to thank our speakers so much. Sean, who's had to go, but Nick, Ralph and Eddie, thank you so much for all the work you've been doing. Um, either for a short period or for an extensive period. It's all made a big difference. And I can see from some of the comments how pleased and excited people were to be part of this event today. Um, we'll continue to share information through Citizen Network over the years. Um, there's lots of information there already. And obviously reach out to Ralph, Eddie and Nick at the Local Area Coordination Network for technical support and advice if this is an idea that to you might be something you could do something with. Okay. Hey, Simon, in the spirit of local coordination, yeah. can I just say everything starts with a conversation? L listening, learning, doing. It'd be, be great to hear, hear from people. There you go. So get in touch, I think is the message. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. Bye Thank for you. now. Bye. Bye.